a great privilege and delight to welcome first to our home last night, and we had a wonderful time of fellowship also with the uh, young people going on the scavenger hunt and playing uh, volleyball and having a wonderful dinner and uh, some s'mores afterwards cook out in the yard there. Uh, Brother uh, Derek Isaacs was with us during that time, and uh, his team always seemed to win. They were very good at volleyball. He's good. <laughs> So it is a, a great delight to have him. Creation Ministries International, as you know, we had a speaker from uh, that organization last year out of Atlanta, Georgia, uh, a very excellent ministry uh, proclaiming the truth that God is the creator, that he created the heavens and the earth in a literal six days, and then, here you go, and then uh, finally uh, on the seventh day he rested. And uh, Brother Isaacs has some very interesting personal stories um, I'm not going to get into those right now, but I mean, he's a wonderful man of God. We are delighted to have him with us to make his first presentation, which is Darwin's Dangerous Ideas. And so, uh, Brother Isaacs, if you'll come up and share with us God's Word. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Amen. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, it's a bit colder than where I'm from. I'm from Alabama. So, uh, yeah. that's right, that's right. The, the three presentations are all very different from each other. You know, this morning, and for those of you who come to all three of them, um, yeah, I'm really encouraged by that because you're really going to walk away tonight, I, th I think, with a lot of new information that maybe you've never been exposed to. Um, in the first presentation, you know, we're going to deal with kind of the social aspects of Darwinism. Charles Darwin, the founder of evolutionary thought. You know, what did his theory mean to society? What impacts have we seen because of evolution? Uh, my second talk is called Battle for Beginnings. That's what I'm doing, you know, in the church service, uh, the main service. Um, it's going to be about the, really what does evolution do to the gospel of Jesus Christ? You know, why is it such a big deal to the church? Uh, and then my third uh, tonight is just something that I love. It's 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 uh, my dinosaur talk, and that's called my specialty talk. And it's you know because the, the big question is how do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? How do we explain it? And it is an evidential approach, which means that we are going to present evidence of man and dinosaur coexistence, and that confirms the biblical worldview. So the three talks are very very different, you know, but um, they're really going to I hope give you a good worldview. Uh, biblical, you know, uh, for biblical creation, and also what does evolution do to our Savior and to our worldview? Um, so we're going to get started, and you know, my first talk is Darwin's Dangerous Ideas, and is is about the the product of of what that theory has done to our society. Now we're going to go over four different periods of evolutionary thought. Okay, I call them the foundations of evolution. Which means, um, and I'll read a lot of this. I know it's not coming through real bright, but I'll be, I'll make sure you guys know what's up here. Um, the foundations of evolution is we're going to pull it from Darwin's writings himself. What did Charles Darwin actually say? All right. We're going to talk about the early adopters, meaning how did that first generation of Charles Darwin, how did they receive his writings, and what did they do because of it? Okay. Then we're going to talk about the present day. What is happening today in your streets outside? That is a result of evolutionary theory. And then also, present day, um, in the future, basically is where it is going, um, what can we expect that's next. Now, we're, most of you guys have known about the origin of species, which is Darwin's first talk. Um, it's his first book. But many of you do not know the full title of it, which is, By Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races, in the struggle for life. Favored races, it's a very interesting kind of jumps out at you, isn't it? A lot of people have heard that term before, but maybe you have not associated that with the theory of evolution. You see, Darwin, early in his life, he traveled quite a bit, and he recorded his journey on these travels in his first book, which is called The Voyage of the Beagle. Now, during that time on the voyage, which was a, the, um, the Beagle was a big ship. He floated around the world in. He saw different people from different continents and countries, um, all around the world, separated by oceans. And what Darwin did is he built a hierarchy of which races of men were more evolved than others. This was made very clear in his third book, which is called The Descent of Man. All right, so these three books, Voyage of the Beagle, Descent of Man, and The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, 
or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life is what we are going to get into today. And we're going to see what he said, uh, kind of right from the horse's mouth, if you will. Now, often we disassociate ourselves from the equation that evolution tries to teach. And what I mean by that is we must remember that the so-called rules of evolution, the survival of the fittest, would also be true to humanity if it was true. So think of how, during this talk, you would modify your behavior, specifically, if evolution were true. Now, that is, this question, of if evolution were true, then how now shall we live, is what led me to really write my first book, which is called The Extinction of Evolution. And it explores the social outcomes of evolutionary thought, stuff we're going to go over today. So let's dive right into it with no further delay. This is Darwin when he was down in South America. These are his words. He wrote, I believe in this extreme part of South America, man exists in a lower state of improvement than any other part of the world. All right, his idea here is clear that he was looking at these tribes of South Americans, and from an evolutionary perspective, genetically, he thinks these South Americans are lesser evolved than other people. Now think about that. What does that mean to us? If there are 6.5 billion people on the planet today, and if evolution were true, then we would have to recognize that not all of these 6.5 billion people, actually it's over 7 billion now, we're not all evolved at the same level, are we, if you believe in evolution? Who would be more advanced than somebody else? Who is greater? Who is lesser? That is actually a hard question if you believe evolution because you have to make those discernments. Darwin decided that the people of South America were the most under-evolved. He's clear in his writings. He continues to develop this line of thought. He says, while going one day on shore near Wollaston Island, we pulled alongside a canoe. These were the most abject and miserable creatures I anywhere beheld. This is Darwin himself speaking. Notice that he doesn't even call these people humans. He calls them rather miserable creatures. He goes on. Their skill in some respects may be compared to the instinct of animals, for it is not improved by experience. The canoe, their most ingenious work, poor as it is, has remained the same for the last 250 years. So what is happening in this, what he is talking about? He's comparing really the instinct of these South Americans kind of to a beaver, right? A beaver has the instinct, to, the, the ability to make a dam, right? But a beaver is not, a new beaver is not going to come to the fold and say, listen, I've got this new architectural design of a new dam that's going to improve water flow efficiency and you know, increase our quality of life. That's not what a beaver is going to do. A beaver is just going to make that dam over and it's never going to stop. It's all their instinct allows them to do. What he's saying about the South Americans is that's like their canoe. They can make this canoe, but that's all their instinct will allow them to make, no matter how much time is given to them. Going on, he said, One of our arms being bared, they expressed the liveliest surprise and admiration at its whiteness. Just in the same way in which I have seen the orangutan do at the zoological gardens. Now, first of all, how do we know, why did Darwin think that these people admired his white skin? Isn't that odd? He didn't speak their language. They probably never saw a, a white man before, and they were probably astonished. But Darwin's psyche made them think that they were jumping up and down, probably because of the big mast on his boat, but that they admired his white skin. Now, he also thinks that the orangutans in the zoo admired his white skin. That's what he's saying. That is an odd assessment of this man. But something far more dangerous has happened here. Do you see what he is? What happened? He connected these people with a kind of ape, didn't he? That's what he did. He said, hey, you know, these people admire my white skin. The orangutan admired my white skin. Not sure how he figured that out. But then he said, wow, they're alike. There's some, and that's the dangerous, dangerous, dangerous idea. He goes on. He goes, nor is the difference slight in moral disposition between a barbarian and a Newton or a Shakespeare. Differences of this kind between the highest of men of the highest races and the lowest savages are connected by the finest gradations. So he just he plays it out for us. We have the high races, we have the low races. They are connected to each other, but gradually through evolution. Charles Darwin also traveled to, traveled to South Africa, and he talked about the South Africans prowling around in search of roots. Now, right after I got married, my wife and I, we moved to South Africa. I was able to le live there for a year and a half. It was a wonderful time. Now, one of the things that I got when I got to South Africa, what was told to me, 
was said, by the way, never say the word kafir. And I said, okay, I won't say the word kafir. Has anyone heard that term before? Okay, a few of you have. In South Africa, it is, if you call someone a kafir, it is actually actionable in a court of law. It's against the law to say that word to somebody. What a kafir means is that it is a person without a soul. And that is what, in a, during apartheid, that is what the white, the white population said to the black population. They called them kafirs, people without souls. Well, I just want him to say that because all through Darwin's writings, when talking about the South, Af South Africans, he calls them kafirs. And if I would not have lived in South Africa, I would have never known what that meant. Now, he asks a very loaded question here. He goes, Darwin wrote, It might also naturally be inquired whether man, like so many other animals, so note he just thinks we're animals, has given rise to varieties and sub-races, differing but slightly from each other, or to races differing so much that they must be classed as a doubtful species. Do you hear what the, that, that loaded question is? He, he says, wait a minute, are some races of men sub-races, subhuman, are some races not even human at all? That they should be classed as something totally different, not a member of humanity. This is what he concluded. He said, do the races or species of men, whichever term may be applied, he wrote, encroach on and replace each other so that some finally become extinct? We shall see that all of these questions must be answered in the affirmative. He says yes. Now, do you know what he means when he says encroach on and replace each other unto extinction? What did he just give a, 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 a reason for? He just justified what? Genocide. Do some races have the right to press upon and exterminate the weaker? He goes, yes. This is why his theory is perfectly summed up in his own words, but the strongest live and the weakest die. He applies no, I mean, he pulls no punches. This is the stuff he wrote. This is the stuff that is not being taught today in classes because, well, if people actually knew what Darwin said, they wouldn't make the little bumper stickers that put on their car and the little Darwin fish that you see. They really exalt this man, but they have no idea who this man was. Next, we need to see how the theory of evolution shaped his views on women. He didn't leave the women out, out of the picture. He wrote, the chief distinction in the intellectual powers of the two sexes is shown by man attaining to a higher eminence in whatever he takes up than woman can attain whether requiring deep thought, reason, or imagination, or merely the use of the senses and hands. The average standard, standard of mental power in man must be above that of a woman. Every time I drive by a fish, uh, 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 like, you know, you see the Darwin fish, you know what I'm talking about? And every time, with the little legs on it, every time I drive by a car that has that on there and a, and a woman is driving that car, I'm like, you have no idea what this guy thinks of you. You have no idea. You know, but just in case this is not clear, he continues. He just wants to make this point clear. He goes, man is more courageous, pugnacious, and energetic than woman, and has more inventive genius. He says, thus man has ultimately become superior to woman. If you believe in evolution, he uses evolutionary reasoning to come up to these conclusions. Now, this would be a very good time to refresh us of the goodness of Christianity, my friends. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen, Amen right? Now, before we read this next quote by Charles Darwin, you need to know he was from a very wealthy family. He, he Extremely wealthy. So he cl includes himself in this unique grouping. And he's talking about physical appearance. How have we evolved into our physical appearance that we have. And how are some people more attractive than other, he determines. He determines it's because of evolution, and this is what he wrote. He says, many persons are convinced, as it appears to me with justice, that means he's, he agrees with this, that members of our, of our aristocracy, including under this term, all wealthy families. So he's like, I'm, I'm a part of this group. He says, from having chosen during many generations from all classes the more beautiful women as their wives, have become handsomer according to the European standard of beauty than the middle of class. I guess he never saw a mirror he didn't like. 
But do you catch what he is saying here? Essentially, rich people have evolved to be naturally better looking, and it's because they get all the pretty women. That's kind of unbelievable, isn't it? But do you see the real evil in this statement? Let's get real serious here. He just turned the entire institute of marriage into a prostitution ring, didn't he? Where women will give themselves to the highest bidder. And we should be indignant over this. Okay? Because marriage is what was given to us as an example between Christ and the church. That's what the institution of marriage is. It's an example for us to understand Christ and the church. And he has turned it into a prostitution ring. Now, before I go further, I should say that modern science has completely dispelled, gotten rid of, eradicated the idea that some people are more advanced than others. Darwin was just completely wrong. Francis Collins, who, who is an evolutionist, and he sequenced the human uh, genome, he said this, Another striking feature of the human genome comes from the comparison of different members of our own species. At the DNA level, we are all 99.9% .9 identical. He goes on to say, thus by DNA analysis, our genes, he says, we humans are truly part of just one family. This remarkably low genetic diversity distinguishes us from most other species on the planet. Now, my friends, why was it such a striking and remarkable feature for this evolutionist that humans have such a low level of genetic diversity? Why was that striking? It is this. The model of evolution Okay, would lead us to believe that different people that grew up oceans apart on different continents and countries would have evolved a much more specialized to their environment. But the evidence doesn't fit their model. It's striking because really we're only one race. There is no black or white. We're really just all shades of brown. That's all we are. Some people are darker than others. I'm a shade of brown that is darker than many of you in here. Then you, that's all it is. We're just different shades of brown. Humanity does not look like at the genetic level what a product of evolution would create. Darwin was clearly wrong and ignorant in, his, in the things that he came up with. Now, that was Darwin. Those are kind of some of the things I wanted you to see of Darwin himself. Now, did I, was I fair to the man? Did I just cherry pick his science? You know, did, you know was it just something that I wanted to kind of cast a bad light on him so I just picked some of the odd things that he said? Or was that really represent, representative of his theory. One of the ways to check this out is to pull from history and what did the early adopters of evolution think? The first couple generations after Darwin released his book in 1859, how did they imbibe that theory and then put it into practice? Okay? Ernest Haeckel, one of the earliest proponents of evolution in the 1900s, said this. He goes, at the lowest stage of human mental development are the Australians, some, of the, some tribes of the Polynesians and the Bushmen, Hottentots and some of the Negro tribes. Nothing, however, is, more, is perhaps more remarkable in this respect than that some of the wildest tribes in southern Asia and eastern Africa have no trace whatever of the first foundations of all human civilization, of family life and marriage. They live together in herds like apes. Haeckel simply echoes what Darwin said. And again, he likens tribes to herds of apes. So the idea that Darwin said really stuck, and it got very, very ugly. Our secular history books leave this out, but in 1906, evolutionists in the Bronx Zoo put a man named Odabinga into the zoo. I'll read what this says here, and that's a picture of the man. Australian Aborigines, well, this is... I'll read this. Australian Aborigines were actually killed and taken to London as museum specimens of the missing link between ape men and the modern humans. A pygmy by the name of Otabinga, this man here, was placed on exhibit in the Monkey House Zoo, in the Monkey House at the Bronx Zoo in 1906. Who knew this? That in America, in the Bronx Zoo, this man was put in a zoo to be the missing link. Aborigines being dug out of their graves also in Australia to be stuffed as museum exhibits. This is true history of evolution. This is what they did. Uh, I think 10 years, in 1916, Odabenga, this man, borrowed a revolver from his friend and he killed himself. Now, then there was a movement that actually tried to apply evolutionary thought to humanity. Okay? And this was called eugenics. 
The early leaders of eugenics were Francis Galton, who was the uh, cousin of Charles Darwin, and Major Darwin, who was Charles Darwin's son. Easily the first adopters, right? Is actually their family. On September 25th, 1921, there was an international eugenics conference in, in America. And this is a, a caption of the New York Times article. And it said this, the headline says, Want more babies and best families. Major Darwin sees a patriotic duty of better classes to increase their offspring. He says, limitation also needed. Dangers of best types disappearing and the inferior multiplying, he tells eugenicists. Remember Darwin's own words about the higher races and how this fits into his theory. Now look at, they want more babies from better families, that's what they're teaching, and they want less babies from inferior types of humans. Less babies is what they wanted. The founder, Planned Parenthood, is America's largest provider of abortions. Abortion clinics have historically been in minority and low-income neighborhoods. Margaret Sanger used the syringe of the abortionist to kill lower advanced humans, according to them. This is the danger of evolution in action, when an ideology replaces Jesus Christ as our foundation. Margaret Sanger uh, published the work, The Purpose of Eugenics and Birth Control and Positive Eugenics. Planned Parenthood is a fruit of evolution. Consequently, this is why pro-life campaigns that say abortion is murder, even though that is true, they're not effective because they have a worldview that says murder is okay. It's deep ingrained into them. Let the strongest live and the weakest die. See, what I want you to see is that abortion is a symptom of a deeper disease, and that deeper disease is the belief in evolution. Edwin Black is an award-winning author, okay, and he studied eugenics, and this is what he said. Eugenic breeders believed American society was not ready to implement an organized lethal solution, but many mental institutions and doctors practiced improvised medical lethality and passive euthanasia on their own. Eugenics spawned out of evolution, and now people who are believing in evolution and eugenics are practicing basically euthanasia. All right? Our country began to kill the weak who were already born in the name of evolution. Watch this. One, he wrote, Black wrote, one institution in Lincoln, Illinois, fed its incoming patients milk from tubercular cows, believing a eugenically strong individual would be immune. 30 to 40 percent annual death rates resulted at Lincoln. They pumped diseases into babies so that those that were under-evolved could be weeded out. And then Edwin Black connected this to the Nazis, and correctly so. He wrote, in 1934, as Germany's sterilizations were accelerating behind beyond 5,000 per month. By the way, why were they sterilizing people? So that their type could not reproduce. Okay. The California eugenics leader bragged to a colleague, you will be interested to know that your work has played a powerful part in the shaping of the opinions of the group of intellectuals who are behind Hitler in this epic-making program. There is evidence that powerful people in the U.S. and in England actually agreed with the strong eugenic direction of Adolf Hitler. Eugenics and Darwin and genetic engineering were the fad leading up to World War II. We often talk about, why didn't they stop Hitler earlier? Well, because there were people in power that secretly agreed with what he was doing. I'm sure when the bomb started to hit London, the people in England rethought that position. Hitler even wrote a fan letter to American eugenics leader Madison Grant calling his race-based eugenics Bible the passing of the great, I'm sorry, the, calling his race-based eugenics book the passing of the great race his Bible. He felt the strongest. What did Hitler do? He felt the strongest had every right to press upon and extinguish the weaker. Darwin's mentality of let the strongest live and the weakest die cannot disagree with what Hitler did. You see, secular academia want to hide evolution behind lab coats, but really we cannot let them do that. That's not what evolution is. Even a famous evolutionist himself, Stephen Jay Gould, who was a Harvard professor, recognized the racist roots of Darwin. And this is what he said. He goes, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1859, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of the evolutionary theory. That is the roots of evolution, and their own people who believe in evolution at high, high, high positions have admitted to that. So where is evolution at today? 
is being taught in our public schools, isn't it? And what is the result of this belief today? Harvard professor E.O. Wilson said this. He, he is an evolutionist, and he wrote this. Humanity was thus born of earth, however elevated in power over the rest of life, however exalted in self-image, we were descended from animals by the same blind force that created those animals. So what do we see here by Wilson? Humanity was born of earth, not God. He's clear about that. And he shoots an arrow over the bow of Christianity because he knows that we believe we were made in the image of God. But he says, no, 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 no. You may have an exalted self-image of yourself, but you're descended from animals. And you're created by the same blind force that created those animals. This is an attack on Christianity. Now, do you see why children today have such a problem with self-esteem, the ones that are going through school systems? Because they are being told they're nothing more than animals created by a blind force. They're nothing more than walking sacks of bone and water that have no purpose behind them. And Professor William Provine sums up perfectly what evolution means if it were carried out to his logical conclusion. This is an evolutionist again, and this is what he said. He goes, let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. There is no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I am going to be dead. That's the end for me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning to life, and no free will for humans either. Remember my opening question when I said, if evolution were true, then how now shall we live? If this were true, how would we carry out our lives? There's no ultimate meaning. There's no basis for morality. If there is no ethics, there is no God. We're just accidents here. Serial killer. Remember the serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer? Remember that guy? Crazy guy, right? He had this chilling statement. He said, if a person doesn't think there is a God to be accountable to, then, then, what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway. I always believed the theory of evolution as truth, that we all just came from the slime. When we, when we died, you know, that was it. There is nothing. Do you know what is the most disturbing part of this quote to me is? That is a rationalized statement. He doesn't sound like a crazy man. He had an axiom that he held to be true. He goes, I believe this, therefore I draw this conclusion. And this is the problem that true evolutionists run into if they're consistent with their worldview. That is why Richard Dawkins said this. Dawkins, who's like the high priest of evolution, he said, I'm a passionate Darwinian when it comes to science, when it comes to explaining the world. But I'm a passionate anti-Darwinian when it comes to morality and politics. Why is he an anti-Darwinian when it comes to morality? Because he's afraid of people like Jeffrey Dahmer. That's why. So he wants the compassion that comes with real Christianity, doesn't he? Without the accountability to our Lord. Well, I'm sorry, he's not going to have it both ways. We're not letting him off the hook on that. The fact is, when you remove God from the equation and insert evolution as our origin, there is no basis for morality. But even so, even though that's the case, evolutionists are trying to form their own religion. It's called Darwin Day, all right? And they're trying to celebrate worldwide on February 12th each year, which is Darwin's birthday. Um, and they celebrate el evolution and humanism. Now, on the, on the website DarwinDay.com, I pulled this quote off. And it said, At this juncture in history, the world has become so small and interdependent that we need a global celebration to promote a common bond among all people. My friends, we see a worldwide religion happening right before our eyes. This next slide demonstrates that. Uh, demonstrates that. It was an advertisement run on buses in London in 2009. This is what the advertisement said. There's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. They're advertising. They're pushing this world view. If evolution was about science, why would it produce this? It's not. There was also a website called Church of Reality. And this was, I pulled this off that website. It said, our world view is real reality. 
We are realists practicing realism, winning souls for Darwin. That's what that says right here. Winning, winning souls for Darwin. How empty is that? And how they're longing for spirituality, they're longing for meaning, but why are they winning souls for the guy that thought women were inferior and that some races were more advanced than others? Steven Pinker, another vocal evolutionist, published an amazing list of questions today, this, you know, of what he wants all of us to consider. And while I read these questions, think of the original statements from Charles Darwin and the early adopters, and look at how things have come full circle. Pinker wrote this. He wrote, do most victims of sexual abuse suffer no lifelong damage? Do men have an innate tendency to rape? Did the crime rate go down in the 1990s because two decades earlier, poor women aborted children who would have been prone to violence? He said, is morality just a product of the evolution of our brains with no inherent reality? Would it be consistent with our moral principles to give parents the option of euthanizing newborns with birth defects that would consign them to a life of pain and disability. My friends, this man is using the cowardice. He's a coward because he's using questions to seed ideas. He's afraid just to come out and say it. He's afraid just to come out and say, no, rape is just an instinct of man. He's afraid just to say, you know, because those babies died, we have a better crime rate today. He's afraid to come out and say those things. So he's asking questions. Who else? deceived by asking a question. Satan in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say that? Did God really say that to you? Evolution is not about science. It's about living a life without God. And then be able to rethink all of these things we know about us, but rethink them without God involved. Here's a list of recent books that have come out from evolutionists recently. The God Delusion, God is Not Great, God the Failed Hypothesis, Godlessness in America. You know, the first time when you look at this, you wonder, for people who don't believe about God, they spend an awful lot of time writing about Him, don't they? This attack on God, on our Savior, is gaining steam in America, in your community right now. It is an ideology where abortion, euthanasia, which is all murder, is already justifiable. And sin will always get worse. Sin is never satisfied with the, with the status quo. It wants to take everything to death. Point in case, look at the final book title, Godlessness in America. What does that really mean? It's a cry to be without God. Now I think about that. Where is mankind when they are eternally separated from God? They're in hell. This worldview has taken people all the way to the end where they are shouting they don't want to be around God. How devastating is that? Not only that, but from their own worldview, and they're a little inconsistent with that last title, from their own worldview, they should already believe there's godlessness in America, right? If they don't believe there's God, then they already have that. So what's the point of writing a book wanting godlessness in America? What is the face of God that they no longer want to see? You. Because from their perspective, they don't think God's there. So they look at you and go, you're the face of God. And you know something? I want godlessness in America. They don't want us here. I'm going to read Revelation 12, 9 here. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. We are told that Satan is the deceiver of the whole world. And I want you to see the destruction of that lie that he said at the very beginning. All of these things that we just went over in this first session is the result of one simple lie. You don't think Adam and Eve are really real, do you? The Bible has given us ample warning. Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. My friends, it is so important that we stand on the Bible 
as our ultimate authority and not to be sucked into secular ideas. Because the biggest point I want to show you is that when a secular idea takes hold, our spiritual discernment should tell us that that will end in utter evil. Because any worldview that starts out with a rejection of God as King, Creator, and Savior can only land in utter evil. And that is what we see with evolution. Now, one of the final chapters of my book, The Extinction of Evolution, is called The Samaritan Trait. All right? And I got that from the Bible, of, you know, the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, one of the things that we see when we take evolution to its logical conclusion is that there is no basis for morality, and really it ends in utter evil. It ends with just murder, thievery, just attack on attack. And when you, you understand that because the entire idea is boiled down to what Darwin himself said, let the strongest live and the weakest die. But in that world system, is there, is there room for a belief like the fruit of the Spirit? There isn't. The Bible tells us, but the fruit of the Spirit is joy, love, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no lie. My friends, when we walk like our Savior Jesus Christ, living in the compassion of the fruit of the Spirit, we become the walking contradiction to evolution because evolution cannot produce things like this. It cannot produce joy, peace, love, patience. And Jesus, when he gave his life to save others, in such a profound way was the evidence we are not a product of evolution because evolution would have never created the traits to give your life for somebody else. It would never have created the traits to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus Christ, in his life, death, and resurrection, was the direct opposite of survival of the fittest. Right? Once you grasp that idea, it's a very powerful, powerful apologetic. Because what kind of world do you want to live in? Do you want to live in the world of evolution, or do you want to live in a world where Jesus Christ says, love your neighbor as yourself? Do you want to live in a world where there is no greater love than to give your life for another? Think of how different that is from survival of the fittest. Your community here needs the answers of Jesus Christ, but they don't know it. They want to live in a community that has love. They want to live in a community that has joy and decency and respect for one another. But they're looking to evolution for that. But evolution cannot provide those things that they want. They just don't need it. That is why the church, us, you, have to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to them because I'm, I'm trying to show you that it is good news. This is the great news, is that Jesus Christ brings the kind of life we want and evolution offers nothing but pain and death my friends today and all the sessions is not about gloom and doom i wanted to show you the history of darwin and say listen our bible that we stand upon has has the answers there is joy in this there is love in this and the world needs to know about it, it is our we have to respond it's our mandate to respond so thank you so much for your attention i know this was a lot to take in but uh Hopefully you understand the battle that we're in and the joy of our Bible because of the fruit of the Spirit. God bless you. Derek, thank you so much. And I want to mention the fact that out in the lobby, there are eight tables set up with all kinds of creation resources available. And um, among those are the book that Derek wrote, also a video that he produced, and uh, we want to make sure that you uh, take the opportunity to look those things over. Uh, we have about 25 minutes until the beginning of the morning worship service. Please be on time for the morning worship service. But we invite you to take a look at those things. And right now, uh, Brother McCoy is passing the plate around if you want to put those envelopes in uh, that we uh, passed out at the beginning of this session. Derek, thank you very much. Very challenging. Just remember that the reason for Hitler's ultimate solution in Germany was based on the theories of Charles Darwin, on the survival of the fittest, on the superiority of certain races over others. And, of course, the Germans considered themselves at that time to be the uh, finest race on the face of the earth, and therefore they are the ones who should uh, be the world conquerors and the world rulers. I have an entire series on the Second World War of footage taking, taken during the war and commentaries uh, that were made at that time 
uh, about what was going on in Europe. And Germany was clearly declaring that they, in the Darwinian scheme, were the highest of all human races on earth and therefore they should be the ones that had world dominion. Very interesting. It's about 15 hours worth of video that was actually made as films back then, of course. It's all black and white uh, during the Second World War and the various speeches that were uh, being given by political figures at that time. Evolution, Darwinism, has consequences. What you truly believe will always translate into what you do. Eugenics, abortion, genetic engineering, all of this kind of thing goes back to we as man are God and therefore we can improve our race much faster than merely natural selection because now we understand it. And so for there, therefore we get rid of those people that we don't think are quite as smart or enlightened as we. And you know where that's going to come to eventually? It's going to come to the elimination of those who believe in God, those who are Christians, uh, those who want to stand for the truth, Satan can't stand the truth. He's a liar and the father of it, John chapter 8. Dear folks, we're in a battle. You can't just sit by and watch it go by you because pretty soon it will overwhelm you. This past week, Richard Smith sent me a very interesting uh, video footage that I had not seen before of the tsunami that hit uh, Japan. And it is perhaps the most... Um, awesome thing that I've ever seen. Uh, it was taken at a, an elementary school which was up on high ground and there were some people taking pictures of one another and then off in the distance you see over a, a mountain ridge you see the tsunami hitting. And down below you can see a gas station, you can see several grocery store kind of businesses, you see cars and trucks going through an underpass and just driving along the highway. But these people focused, and this video is about five and a half minutes long, they focused on the tsunami which they saw had hit the coast. But they obviously thought they were safe. And then that wave comes roaring along and it comes over the first ridge. And they're still videotaping it. And uh, then it begins to come through a, a valley, sort of from the right to the left. And it begins to wash buildings and you see the buildings actually being picked up and smushed together and crushed as it goes along and then it comes and the truck has just gone under this underpass and suddenly there's this huge flow of water that comes out of the underpass and you see this gas station sign which is down in the valley all of a sudden floating along along with a gas station and people who are standing there taking pictures lower on the slope begin to realize something's happening Water begins to come into the houses that are close down to the slope and you see people climbing up and trying to get away from the slope and obviously some of them older people not able to move very fast. And the waves take them in. Folks, that is what is happening with evolution in the United States and around the world. People who just thought they could watch and photograph and finally the people who are taking the pictures, you see them beginning to scramble and go up. They were safe. They got there. They were on a high enough ground where it didn't reach them by the time the thing finished. But you see people being swept away. They had actually been watching it, but they didn't move out of the way fast enough. And then the houses in the near distance begin to crumble and people running out of those houses trying to get up the slope. That is happening with evolution today. And that's what's happening to the Church of Jesus Christ. This past week I got an email from a, an Episcopalian priest who was all mad about the fact that we were having a creation conference, telling us how stupid that was. It has infiltrated the Church. It has infiltrated where people are coming under the the spell of Satan. Dear folks, we have to stand against it. Well, I'm going to close in prayer and then we will have uh, an opportunity. You can look at the uh, books and videos and so on in the back. Derek will be there to answer some questions. After the service tonight, he will be able to answer a lot more questions uh, that you have from the floor. Very exciting. This next message and then tonight, of course, uh, where you hear about dinosaurs and dragons, which he's actually produced a video on. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you that you are the God of creation. You are the one who spoke the word and it came into being. Oh, Father, how we thank you that you are a God who doesn't 
have to struggle along and hope he can make something that will work and then get it better and make it a little bit better later on. You are the God who creates perfectly. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for this message we've heard and the warning of what this does to morals, to ethics, to worldviews, to the way in which people live. And Father, how we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ, which turns us from that darkness to light and to love and to true joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and meekness and temperance. Father, how we thank you for the word of God, which gives us the light that we need for faith. Father, again, we pray for your blessings on this word as it has gone forth, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.